I said, it's been a powerful night tonight, yeah? You know why it's powerful? Because Jesus is in the building. He's all you need to make the service amazing. Do you know that Jesus had no marketing strategy to get people to his meetings that included, you know, pamphlets or flyers or folders. He didn't have to hire a team for hundreds of thousands of dollars. The Bible said the power of the Holy Spirit when people would get healed and people would get touched. It said they came out to meet him in large crowds to see the power of God. Jesus' marketing strategy was always the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what we need to get back to more than ever? Leaning on the power, knowing the power, depending on Jesus to be the superstar. Because I don't know if you understand or that you knew, but um, there are no celebrities in Christianity. You can, you can stop it. There are no celebrities in Christianity. I'm not hearing amen from enough people. There are no celebrities like... The only celebrity is Jesus. Like, and the greatest we get to be is foot washers. The highest level you get is a foot washer. You get to take dirt off of people. That's the highest privilege you have. But there's no celebrities going on. We can't walk in there and say, ooh, I deserve this, or you owe me something. Who are you? You deserve hell. That's what I know. You didn't deserve mercy. You see, God owes us nothing, but he gave us everything. You understand, Jesus took everything you deserved so you could have everything he deserves. Do you get that? He took everything you deserved so you could have everything he deserves. We're in the middle of a fast. Who's actually fasting? Let's be honest right now. God's watching you. God's watching you. Okay, bing, bing, bing. And whether or not you're missing food or whatever's going on, I just want you to know it's a good thing that you're suffering. Can I just open up the sermon by saying you should be happy you're suffering? <laughs> I didn't expect a lot of claps on that because it's not exactly the most encouraging point. But let me explain something to you. If you're gaining weight while you're fasting, you're not fasting. <laughs> Can I just say that? Some people fast, and they call it a Daniel fast. And they're having nachos because, you know, corn chips. And they got trays of nachos coming out with the vegan cheese. Some of y'all have done this. Trays. You got smoothies that are like 48 ounces. Like. You gained five pounds on a 21-day fast. What happened? You made sure you were stocked up on those bananas, let me tell you. My God. Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, 2 and 3. I only have a few minutes. I want to get right to this. I'm going to read a bunch of scripture. So just follow along with me. It would also be on the screen. And then we're going to pray and have a real moment to touch God at the end of the service. Matthew 6, 2 and 3. Jesus is speaking. When you give to someone in need... Don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward they're ever going to get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Matthew 6, 5 through 6, the same chapter, a little bit down. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward they're going to get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, pray to your father in private, then your father in private who sees everything will reward you. Let's go a little bit further down, same chapter, Jesus, same sermon, preaching Matthew 6, 16 through 18. And when you fast, he said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, the expectation is we do all of these things all the time. I want to talk to you today about a lifestyle of power. A lifestyle of power. It's not a moment of power. It's not a season of power. You see, one of the biggest problems 
is here's the great thing. It's awesome. Many of our churches now, who knows who started it? Obviously, it was the Bible that had the idea about fasting, but the American church in general, just to be honest, is not big fans of fasting. They're not all about suffering, going without food. You know what I mean? I mean, billions of dollars are made every year for food. McDonald's and Taco Bell and KFC and, man, if I keep going, some of y'all are going to start slobbering because you're fasting right now. Big Macs and fire wings, chicken wings and enchiladas and, and oh God, Jesus, right? It's not popular to fast. Doesn't feel good to deny yourself something you want. But Jesus expected if you're a Christian, you would do it all the time. Let me just ask you a question. Let, let, it said, when you give to somebody, can you imagine if Jesus only gave once? Think if he only gave once. Why am I saying this? Because for most people, the 5% of Christians in Christianity who fast, they fast once a year, the beginning of the year. And you know what? Hey, we're proud of you. Thank you. Maybe it's your first time fasting. Maybe it's your first one. Hey, welcome. It, it's amazing. It's different for sure. But let me just tell you something. You don't stop at one time. It, what if God only gave one time? Can you imagine if Jesus, he came down and just, let's take one story that he gave that. Let's take the story where he's with the, 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 the 5,000 men, not to women, mention women and children. And he's got the, the loaves of bread and the fish. And can you imagine Jesus walking over there and saying to his disciples, well, guys, today's the day. This is my one time. Better make it good. He breaks it. Everybody's in awe. He feeds 5,000 men, not to mention women and children. And at the end of the day, he's like, well, I gave. What if he didn't give again the next day? What if he didn't give the Sermon on the Mount? What if he didn't tell us how to forgive people that hate us? What if he didn't give us the information? What if he didn't give us his love and understanding? What if he didn't give his life on the cross? What, what about praying? What if Jesus only prayed one time? You know that time, you know, this is how you should pray. The disciples come and they ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray. What if that was the one time and he's like, you know, okay, guys, so this is how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be our name. It, and he says the whole prayer and he says, well, I just prayed. It's done. What if he wouldn't have said the prayer on the cross? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. None of us would be forgiven today. What if he only prayed once? As crazy as that sounds, is as crazy as it sounds to expect that you can fast once and have a lifestyle of power. When you give, when you pray, when you fast, you're going to be doing this all the time because you have to stay clean. You have to stay humble. You have to stay broken. You have to stay before me so you can hear something this year. Some of y'all are putting all your chips and thinking, I'm going to hear God during this fast. And you know what? A lot of you will hear God during this fast. But I got news for some of y'all. This isn't doubt. I've done this all my life. And I'm telling you, especially the last 20 years, I don't always hear God on a fast. Does that mean I don't seek him when the fast is over? These are honest questions. Think about this. Jesus, Luke 4, 1 through 2, full of the Holy Spirit, listen to this, returns from the Jordan. He's led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Led by the Spirit into a wilderness. Led by the Holy Ghost into an uncomfortable place. Led by the Spirit into some pain. Led by the Spirit into some suffering. If you have been told in Christianity... That the Holy Ghost is only going to lead you to green pastures. I promise it will end up that way. But you might have to go through some deserts on the way. Because only in the wilderness, places that are lonely, places where it's hard, places where it's difficult, do you grow into the person that can handle the promise. Some of y'all aren't ready for the promise. 
God hasn't made you the person ready for the promise. So you got to go through something where your flesh gets crucified to a place that when God gives you the promise, you'll be ready for it. It says, look at this, so powerful. Jesus ate nothing all that time and he was very hungry. Luke 4, 13 through 14. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, so now he's done, he left him until the next opportunity came. Then Jesus returned to Galilee. Look at these words. Filled with the Holy Ghost power. He went in, led by the Holy Ghost. He had the Holy Spirit, but he came back in the fullness of power. What happened? When he went out, he already had the Holy Ghost. But fasting is what releases the power of the Holy Ghost through your life unhindered. He already had the Holy Ghost, but it's fasting that breaks the bondage, that resists the Holy Ghost. It's the cracking of the shell of your flesh. You want the power, I understand. Everybody wants to see your family saved. Everybody wants to see you lay hands on the sick and recover. I, I, absolutely. God promises these things to you. And a lot of times just by believing, but there is a kind that does not come out but by prayer and fasting. Some of y'all, your brothers, they ain't got just something you can pray for. They got a stronghold. Some of your sisters don't just have something, you know, that you can, they just come around. No, 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 no. They got demons after them. Their mind's going crazy. They don't want to live anymore. That's not the same thing. They need someone who's going to stop preaching at them and get on their knees and get on their hands and begin to declare war God's way. He goes in in power. Listen to this. This is so powerful. Adam and Eve. Adam releases sin into the world through eating. Jesus releases the most powerful life-saving ministry through fasting. The devil, listen, Adam lets sin enter into the world through eating. Jesus entered into his ministry through fasting. Every single thing, listen to this, everything that Jesus did, he says, the works that I do, you must do. But Jesus started his works through fasting. Don't you think you and I are going to have to start the same way? You see, we want everything, but we don't like to suffer. And please understand, I'm not talking about the same kind of suffering as like the early churches suffered. Just listen to a couple of these facts. For the first 400 years of the church, the test to become a minister was this. You had to have the ability to memorize and recite all four gospels by memory. If you wanted to preach or be a teacher, you had to be able to recite all four gospels by memory. What's our qualifications now? Oh, they're really nice, and, you know, I think they know the word pretty well, and they'll be great. In the fourth century, this is early church, there was a man called Evagrius Ponticus. Listen to this. He said that if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you had to read and recite by memory all 150 psalms every day. These are our leaders in the early church. The next man who came, his name was John Cassian. He comes later, and he's the next one after him. He said, that's too much. That's crazy. Every day, he said, we got to loosen this thing up. Um, we'll do it every second day. <laughs> Recite and memorize all 150 psalms every two days if you want to be a disciple. You see, the word disciple comes from the word discipline. Discipline. You cannot be a disciple if you don't know how to discipline your own flesh. By 12 years old, this is in Jewish culture, still to today. By 12 years old, if, if a child wanted to become a rabbi's pupil, they would have to memorize the entire first five books of the Bible, the entire Pentateuch, and be able to recite it. By 12 years old. What's your 12-year-old kid doing? Man, that Fortnite, I'm getting it. 
John Wesley is a famous uh, you know, pioneer of the church. He would not ordain anyone if they were unwilling to fast at least every week, Wednesday and Friday. At least two days a week. He said that's the minimum. John Wesley started, was incredible as a Methodist minister, started the entire Methodist movement, incredible for the church. But we now as Christians have become a little weak. I didn't say a lot, but you said it. I didn't say it, he said it. We like a sugar daddy Jesus. Oh Lord, we call, you know what we call suffering? Oh man, let me tell you what we call suffering today. Ha! We got people who built the church on the blood of their families, giving their life so that we could have this book. This is what we call suffering. Lord, I've been asking now for two weeks, and Lord, you're really putting me through it. I've been asking for two months, and I still ain't seen the Lord. You're putting me through this, Lord. I know you're just testing me right now. I'm just being tested. You start fasting. You fast one day without food, 24 hours. You're like, oh, God, I'm suffering for you, Jesus. Am I talking the truth? 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 10. I'm going to get off of that. Watch this. This is what Paul said was the qualifications for a minister. You ready? This is the New Testament qualification for a minister. But in all these things, Paul said, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. This is what makes us ministers. In much patience. It's going to require a lot of patience. You want to be used by God. In tribulations. In needs. In distresses. In stripes, where? Upon his back, he was beaten three times with rods. In imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, plural, fastings. He lived a lifestyle of fasting by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown. It wasn't about their image. He said, we're unknown. But we're obeying God because it wasn't about what you saw me do. It wasn't about my Instagram account. It wasn't about how big my Facebook following is. It's not about who's on my YouTube channel. Between you and God, are you obeying the Lord? That was enough for the early church. God, I have peace with God. That was enough. It's not enough for us now. If we don't have a physical following, if we don't have the people that praise our name, if we don't have 500 likes on the photo that we just pressed, we don't have an identity. We're not worth anything. Teenagers are committing suicide at a higher level than ever before because they get their identity from how many likes they got on a post. He says, I'm, I might be unknown my entire life, but I'm known by Jesus. I know one thing Paul says, when I get to heaven, he knows my name. He knows my name. Do you remember the seven sons of Sceva? Remember they go around in the book of Acts and they're trying to cast out devils? Remember what they say? This is so powerful. I thought this was one of the coolest scriptures in the Bible. It said that they go and they try to cast them. They said, in the name of the one that Paul serves, come out. And the demon speaks back to them. And you got demons speaking to you, man. Remember this. If demons are speaking, it's only because they feel they have the right to say something. You need to shut them up. They ain't got no airtime. Jesus didn't let demons speak, but one time he asked his name. That was it. He didn't let them have airtime. I don't want the devil on this microphone. What are you doing? We got ministers. Come on, devil, speak. I don't want to hear a demon. Just get out of him. Go to dry places. Come on, man. Anyway. <laughs> Why am I listening to a demon speak in a microphone? Anyway. <laughs> he says, he says, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. In other words, is your life to a place where hell knows your name? Yeah. 
You better watch out because Christian is coming around. Christian's walking in the door. Christian has authority and he actually knows who he is. You better watch out. Maribel's coming in the door. You better watch out. Ashley's coming in the door. Cassandra's about to walk in. Do the demons stand up and go, oh my God, when you come in the building? Because that's the way Christians are meant to live. We're supposed to be the head and not the tail. We're supposed to be above and not beneath. We're not supposed to be lagging. Oh, well, Gavin, that's so arrogant. It's so arrogant. You're acting so prideful. Are you kidding me? I ain't talking about me. I'm talking about the Jesus who's inside of me. I'm coming with a God. It says his train fills the temple. Do you know what that means? That means his authority is unending. The longer the train of the king, the longer the train of the king, the bigger the kingdom was that he had. His train doesn't fill five feet. It fills the whole temple. The authority is unending. And he says, I give you the authority. Okay. You see, when you're fasting, you're revoking the natural to invoke the supernatural. When you're fasting, you're placing yourself in the center of God's focus and attention. When you're fasting, it's a physical starvation, but it's a spiritual feast. So I know that you're hurting physically, but your spirit is getting fed. Try to take your mind off of the enchiladas for one day and start realizing that what's going on is you're winning battles already in the year that you haven't even got to yet. You're already beginning, you have an unfair advantage already this year because when you declare a fast, you put yourself in the frequency of God's radio station. You're gonna hear everything that comes across the frequency. Why? Because fasting unclogs your ears. Fasting, you see the world gives you a lot of earwax. It puts it in you. You get confused about stuff you shouldn't be confused about. But when you fast, you just take that thing and say, has that been in there that long? Has that been in my heart that long? Have I really had that kind of unforgiveness for this long? Am I still not over that yet? Am I still bitter at that person? God will reveal things when you fast. Some of y'all, and this is crazy, some of y'all get scared because you start having bad dreams when you fast or you'll start having crazy visions when you fast. What's going on? You got to understand that when you declare war against the enemy, he doesn't like it. And what's happening is you're drawing things to the surface that are deep down in you. And until you declare, ser- listen, until you get serious with God, he's not serious about taking your issue away. You got to get serious with God and he gets serious with you. Fasting is how you say, God, I'm serious about this. Some of y'all been in that same temptation for seven years, eight years, nine years. Fast 72 hours and tell me what begins to happen to you. Do this 21 day fast with all of your heart. Second Chronicles 714, at times I might shut up the heavens, oh wow, or no rain will fall. The grasshoppers may devour your crops or send plagues to you. Then, but if my people who are called by my name, come on, say it, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven and restore their land. In other words, if my people will get serious about something, I'll get serious about that something that they're asking about. Watch what this is. It said if they'll humble themselves and pray. Can I tell you something? God does not answer the the prayers of people. So quiet now. God does not answer the prayers of people. That's not biblical. He answers the prayers of humbled people. The Bible says he keeps his distance from the proud, but he draws close to the humble. Another verse says he ignores the prayers of proud people. He doesn't answer your prayer just because you come to the Wayroad Outreach. It matters to God the spirit at which you pray. It matters to God the posture you come into his presence with. It matters to the Lord. And remember, God will not humble you. The Bible says you have to humble yourself. God's not going to humble you. 
You have to humble yourself. Let's look at what the Bible says, how you do this. Psalms 138 verse 6. Though the Lord is exalted, he regards the lowly and invites them into his fellowship. But the proud and haughty, he only knows from a distance. Can you imagine all the healing you need and it's just over there, but it can never come close? All the breakthrough you need, it can never come close. All the identity you need, it's right over there, but it will never come close because you're already acting like you can do it. You're already acting like your life is fine. You're not desperate. You see, here's the thing. You will always tolerate. You will always tolerate things in your life until you become truly sick of them to the point of change. Some of y'all just aren't sick enough. You're not sick about it enough now. You're not feeling like, man, you might be going into 2024 now just thinking that this problem is going to go away. But can I tell you something? The enemy is sticky. He doesn't unattach just because you didn't give him any attention. You have to go at this thing. You got to get serious about this. You have to say, Lord, it stops now. This in my family stops now. This in my dreams stops now. My sleep will be healed now. My family is coming to the Lord now. There's got to be a declaration. Psalm 35, 13, but as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, mourning and garment. Look at this. I humbled my soul with fasting. How do you humble yourself? You declare a fast. You humble yourself with fasting. I humble my soul. What's your soul? Your mind, I think. You got to break that thing. Because you might have some thoughts that aren't according to God's mind. Your, your wants and desires, I want. You might have to break that thing through fasting because your wants are not in alignment with God's desires right now. I feel your emotions have been running your year. Fasting will stand in the road as a roadblock to your emotions and say, you will not take over my life for the rest of this year. Your emotions have been running your days. Your emotions have been running your weeks. But fasting is a declaration that says to your soul, God is in charge. David in Psalm 42 said this. He said, so what is going on with you? He woke up one day. He's like, why are you downcast? But he didn't stop there. He said, you're going to praise God. You're going to put your hope in the Lord. You see, some of y'all don't know how to preach to yourself. The greatest preacher in the world is not Pastor Marco for you or Christian for you. The greatest preacher in the world is yourself. Fasting has changed nations. I'm going quick now. Think about Jonah in the city of Nineveh. I'm not going to read it all. He goes to declare the curse over Nineveh, but what happens? The king of Nineveh hears what Jonah says, and he said he gets up from his throne. He tears his clothes in repentance. He puts on sackcloth, and he tells all of his people, we're not going to eat any food or drink any drink because maybe God will have mercy on us. And an entire nation through fasting turned the curse of judgment, and God brought mercy Think about Esther. Esther, literally, they were about to have genocide. I'm talking Hitler level genocide of the Jewish people. They're all about to be wiped out in a few days time. Esther hears about it and she tells Mordecai, tell the people to fast. Three days, no water. Three days, no food. And call on the name of the Lord. And do you know what happens? The very man, Haman, who was going to annihilate all of them, he, remember, listen, he put a pole, the Bible says pole, feet tie, a big pole, that he was going to put one of the main people on that pole to hang him. He's the one who ends up on the pole. You see, the very thing the devil had planned, it goes back on him. Every plan of destruction falls back on his head. Every single curse bounces back and comes back. You see, when you fast this year, God's going to open your eyes. He's going to touch you. He's going to touch you in such a way. Luke 2, 37. There was a widow who lived in the temple, the Bible says, and Jesus came as a baby. Go ahead, Jeremiah, start playing something. Uh, authority. And Jesus comes as a baby. And the Bible says that Jesus was being anointed to be uh, consecrated as a baby. 
And there's a woman named Anna. The Bible said that she comes and recognizes Jesus. Nobody told her. Nobody said his name. Nobody said who he was. She walks by and she recognizes it's Jesus. Why? Listen to the verse. She lived as a widow, Luke 2, 37. As a widow to the age of 84. Wow. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. You see, a lifestyle of fasting changes what you see. You're looking at your marriage right now through the wrong lens. But you begin to fast and pray for your husband, your wife, your eyes are going to shift. You're going to see there's more for you than are against you. You're going to see that there is not a tomb that is empty, but a Jesus who is calling your name, just like Mary. Your eyes need to change this year. The way you're seeing your family needs to change this year. The way you're seeing your marriage needs to shift this year. The way that you see yourself needs to change this year. Daniel, Daniel 6, 18 through 20, it's powerful. The Bible says, I don't know if you've seen this, but he's accused wrongly. He's thrown into a pit of lions. But look at this. Darius the king begins to fast and pray. Darius the king who was ungodly what was happening was he was repenting and fasting through repenting he humbled himself as a king and he repented because Daniel had touched his life so deeply Daniel had impacted this king so deeply that he's fasting and praying all night long now watch what's happening while he's fasting and praying in his room Daniel is in a pit Daniel's in a pit underneath the ground with lions all around him but there was a king who was fasting and praying above the ground. And while he's fasting and praying, the angels are moving on the prayers of Daniel and the king. And it shut the lion's mouth. Can I tell you something? You are so, this is not the time to be worried about your son. This is not the time to be worried about your daughter and in fear. This is not, I don't know what pit they've fallen into. I don't know where they're at that you can't reach them. But this is the time to get on your knees, to get in your hands, to open up your heart, to humble yourself. You can change what goes on in a pit you can't see when you pray to a God in private. You see, he says when you pray and fast, I will see what you do in secret and I'll reward you in public. Listen to this, listen to this. Please, this is a word for so many of you. God told me this this year, and this is a word for so many. He told me, he said, Gavin, I want you to make some secrets with me this year. Secrets. Secret times of prayer nobody knows about. I want more secrets with you. I want you to create moments, fast that nobody knows you're going on, prayers that nobody knows you're doing, ways that you're giving to people that nobody else needed to know about. Because the God who sees what you do in private will reward you in public. You don't make history. You don't make history in front of people. You make history on your knees alone with God. If you'll make history with God in private, he will make history through you in your sphere of influence all over the world. This is my last one. Choir, everybody stand up. Get your mics. I'm talking about a lifestyle of power. Paul, the Bible says that Peter goes to prison but the church was earnestly praying for Peter while he was in prison. And one night an angel of the Lord comes, unlocks Peter's chains, and lets him out. You know why? Because even though man put him in prison, God just needed the prayers of someone. He doesn't need, you got to understand, God doesn't need all the things you think he needs. He just wants somebody to get in alignment with him. Humble themselves. He doesn't answer the prayers of people. He answers the prayers of humbled people. If you want a lifestyle of power, 
This is the last time this fast is the only one you do all year. I want to ask you this question. Is there anybody in here right now who says that this is the last time I fast once a year? Would you put your hand up right now? I want you to make a declaration right now. What's going to happen? God's going to tell you when to fast. You're going into a lifestyle of fasting. When you pray, when you give, when you fast. You see, he's in prison, but they're over here praying. He's in prison, but they're over here praying. And their prayers over here are determining the difference of what happens to him over there. Your children don't need you to preach at them this year. They need you to declare a fast and get on your knees and pray until they get off of that addiction. You need to pray until they come to church. You need to pray. Every eye closed. Right now, I'm challenging you to make this moment a declaration. God is seeing you everywhere that you're at. Every person right now, God is with you. He sees you. God can do things nobody else can do. He's got all authority. When Jesus came back, rose from the dead, he came to his disciples and he didn't say, I got some authority. He said, all authority has been given to me. The authority to change your son's life. The authority to change the situation of your family. The authority to turn your business around. All authority is in Jesus. But I need you right now. Just understand. It's only humbled people that God is looking for. And you have to humble yourself. The whole point of this message was to ask you, who are the people in here right now that dedicate to say, I am no longer going to be a once a year faster, but I want a lifestyle of power and I am going to make fasting a lifestyle. I'm going to keep myself at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to be serious about what God is serious about. There's no longer, these people are saying, I no longer, I'm going to be led by God in fasting. I'm going to be fasting. God's going to have another fast. When January ends, I'm not going to end it. I'm going to stay with God because my family still needs it, because my marriage still needs it, because I need to hear God clearly. I need to be unhindered. If that's you, I want you right now to come to this altar and get on your knees you say that's me I right now I'm dedicating to a lifestyle of fasting come up this isn't for everybody don't do this if you don't mean it God is watching right now I'm talking a lifestyle of power a lifestyle of power consider your choice right now God takes your vows very seriously lifestyle of fasting lifestyle of power lifestyle of praying lifestyle of giving this is a solemn moment nobody else moving right now people are coming up to this altar making a declaration search your heart if you're still sitting there i know you don't like it but that's why it's good for you I know you don't like it, but that's why it's good for you. Our flesh steals so much from us. But God said that through his power in a thing called grace, he gave you the power to not just stay away and be healed or forgiven of sin, but he gave you power to conquer the sins in your life. You can have control over your flesh. It's called self-control. As you close your eyes and pray to the Lord right now, we're going to sing this song. Everybody else, I want you to be seeking God. This is the beginning of a new year. You got to hear God like you never have before. You have got to get strength like you've never had before. This is the moment. I would call out on the Lord and I would speak to him personally right now in this moment. One word. Let's sing it.
Sing it again. One word. One word. One word from you. Just one word. Things change at your authority. Not on my authority, but yours. That's all you need. One word. It's all gonna change. From you, things change on your authority. Your word, it's true. Things change. We're gonna sing all authority. On your all authority belongs to you. Yes, Jesus. All authority belongs to you. Let's all sing this together right now. It doesn't belong to Satan. It belongs to God. The authority belongs to Jesus, not your enemy. It belongs to Jesus. He's still on the throne. He's still on the throne. Think about your son, your daughter. All authority belongs to Jesus. Think about that, that, that addiction you need broken. Where is it at? Let's sing it with all of our voices now. Every person, I want you to sing this out. All authority. All authority. All authority. Christian, if you'll come up and join me up here. Come up and join me. This is our campus pastor. Can you give him a hand? Listen. Everything that we have to give, Pastor Marco, all pastors on staff, we have no authority of our own. It comes from the authority of Jesus. We have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves the same way you humble yourself. Can I ask you, could you pray for us this year like you've never prayed for us before? Could you pray over Pastor Christian and his family? You got to understand, could you pray over me and my family this year? We need blessings. Pastor Marco this year, can you bless him and his family? Let's lift our hands out right now. He might be watching from somewhere right now. Let's pray for Pastor Marco right now. Jesus, we thank you for our pastor. 
We thank you, God, for this amazing church. We thank you, God, for Lisa. We thank you for every single one of his daughters. We thank you for the blessing they are to us. Now, God, we just rebuke the enemy. We take authority over every single scheme of the devil. We thank you that he walks in power like he's never walked before. We thank you that Pastor Marco walks in rest this year. That he walks in a peace that he's never known. We thank you, Jesus, God, for the unity of their family to be closer than it's ever been. We thank you, God, that the words that come out of his mouth will be fire. I see fire coming out of Pastor Marco's mouth this year. So much fire. God, I thank you that this is the harvest year. This is a year for souls like we've never seen before. This is a year for souls like we've never seen before. Come on, somebody say amen. This is the year for souls. Right now, wherever you're at, do you know Jesus? Right where you're at, we just want you to make a simple acknowledgement and say, this is the night. I'm making an acknowledgement that I know Jesus. I will have a peace in my heart. You can't buy peace. Only knowing Jesus will give you that. If you say, you know what, Gavin, I'm not saved. I don't know Jesus. Or I walked with the Lord before, but I want to rededicate my life. Would you lift your hand right now? One, two, three. Lift it up everywhere. I see you over here. I see you over here. Look, God is watching you. God is why I see every single hand. Every single hand. Would you all pray this prayer with me out loud? Say, dear Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your blood that washed me clean. I thank you in Jesus' name that I am no longer guilty because of what you did on the cross. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for washing me clean. Help me, Jesus, to become a disciple. I dedicate to become a disciple this year. Jesus, I'm no longer guilty. I'm no longer guilty. But now I am free and I am forgiven. Give him a hand right now, everybody. Praise God. Amen. God is good. We love you, church. Let's give Gavin and the whole worship team and the youth team a big round of applause. It was awesome. Tonight was a special night. You know, we went a little longer than normal, but that's okay. Sometimes it's good to spend time in the presence of God. But we love you so much. Have a wonderful night. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. We're going to be here Sunday at 9 a.m., 11 a.m. And if you speak Espanol, we'll see you at 1.30. We love you so much. God bless you. Remember, if God is for you, there's no one who could come against you. God bless.